Hi everyone, I had a request asking for a video about the prisoner's dilemma and yes I certainly can do a video or maybe even three or four videos about this game because I actually really love this game. This video will center around the story of the prisoner's dilemma and as part of that I'll talk about how we present the information in the story in a matrix, I'll solve for the equilibrium outcome of the game and I'll talk about the central features of The Prisoner's Dilemma. So that's this video. I will include chapters in the description below if you want to skip to any particular part. Now I will say that this video won't cover everything. The Prisoner's Dilemma is a really big topic, but I've got more videos planned. So I'll link to any related videos below in the description once they're finished. And I'll also add them to my game theory playlist. All right, so let's first just talk about the story of The Prisoner's Dilemma. So we start with two prisoners, prisoner number one and prisoner number two. And they've been doing some bad stuff. They've both been involved in a lesser crime which they could get jail time for, but they're also both involved in a much worse crime. The police have them in custody and have enough evidence to charge both of our prisoners with the lesser crime, but the police are actually more interested in convicting anyone for the worst crime. And although they are certain of prisoner one and prisoner two's involvement in the worst crime, the police don't have enough evidence to convict either of those prisoners for that crime. So what the police are going to do is that they'll separate our prisoners and offer each of our prisoners a deal. So the police will approach prisoner one and they'll say to them, look, we're going to convict you on this lesser crime, but if you tell us about prisoner number two's involvement in the worst crime, we're going to be very lenient with you regarding the sentencing for the first crime. Perhaps, you know, we'll even let you go completely for that crime. They'll also at the same time go to prisoner number two and they'll say a similar thing. They'll say, look, we've got you for the lesser crime. We can put you in jail for that, but we'll be lenient in our sentencing with you. Maybe we'll even let you go completely. No jail time if you tell us about prisoner number one's involvement in the worst crime. And so the hope is, from the perspective of the police, that prisoner number one will implicate prisoner number two in the worst crime, and prisoner number two will implicate prisoner number one in the worst crime, and then the police can convict both prisoners for that worst crime. So that's the situation. And then our textbooks or our courses will present a matrix that might look something like this, but there'll be some numbers inside and I'll bring them up in a second. The numbers inside the matrix are going to represent the number of years in prison for each of our prisoners associated with each possible outcome. And we actually have four possible outcomes here. So the top left hand cell is when both prisoner one and prisoner two stay silent. So neither make a deal with the police. And in this case, they're both going to get charged for the lesser crime, but neither will get charged for the worst crime because no one has made a deal with the police and, and, and no one's ratted each other out. And you can really put in any number here because what matters is how the numbers in the cells relate to one another. In my example, I'm just going to put down two years each here. So our prisoners will get two years each if they both remain silent. Now I'll just put as an, a note down here, when I write down the years in prison in the matrix, I'm going to put prisoner one's outcome first and then prisoner two's. Now back to our cells though, the bottom right hand cell, this is where both prisoners cooperate with the police. They become police informants, both of them. This is sometimes called thinking. Prisoner one would tell the police about prisoner two's involvement in the worst crime, and prisoner two would tell the police about prisoner one's involvement in the worst crime. Both of them, as part of that deal, get clemency or leniency on the lesser crime, but they will both get done for the worst crime. So for my example here, I'm going to say they both get eight years in jail here. So of course I can choose a range of numbers here, but I just have to make sure that those numbers are worse than if both of our prisoners stayed silent. So a worse outcome are than two years in prison each. Now, alternatively, prisoner one could become a police informant, so they could inform against prisoner two, and prisoner two could stay silent. So that's the bottom left-hand cell. Now, in this case, prisoner one will get all of the benefits from the deal. So let's just say they get complete clemency on that lesser crime. So no years in prison for the lesser crime, but also prisoner one is not going to get done for the worst crime because prisoner two has stayed silent. So they will get zero years in jail. But prisoner two doesn't get any leniency for the lesser crime 
and also gets implicated in the worst crime by prisoner one. So they get more jail time than the eight years, which is what they get if both prisoners think, because that's the outcome if both of our prisoners only really get done for the worst crime. Uh, so let's say 12 years. So it has to be a number or length in time in jail greater than eight. Now, lastly, prisoner one could stay silent and not talk to the police at all, while prisoner two could think on prisoner one and become a police informant. In this case, we would get the opposite sort of outcome. Prisoner one would end up getting 12 years in jail for their involvement in both the lesser and the worst crimes, whilst prisoner number two ends up going completely free. They get leniency, in fact, complete clemency for the lesser crime, and they do not get implicated in the worst crime by prisoner number one. So that's our matrix of, of outcomes. If we just want to think about the matrix for a sec, I'll make it bigger. When we solve for this game, we're just going to require that in each case, our prisoners just prefer the lesser number of years in jail. So the smaller the number, the better. Now I should say it's much more common and actually kind of standard practice to read the numbers inside game theory matrices as payoffs. So usually we say that the higher the number, the better. So this story can be a little bit confusing in that sense because the numbers are years in jail. If you are interested or if you need it, I did do another video on the basics of game theory matrices. So how to interpret and solve for simultaneous move games, Nash equilibrium and dominant strategies are kind of more generally. So I'll link to that video below. But Basically, if we're prisoner one and if prisoner two stays silent, we would be on this column here. Prisoner one could also stay silent and get two years in prison or become a police informant and get zero years in prison. Zero is the better option for prisoner one. So becoming an informant is prisoner one's best response to prisoner two's being silent. And so I'm going to underline under that zero here to indicate that as a best response. Now, if prisoner two becomes an informant, we're on this column here, prisoner one could stay silent and get 12 years or also inform and get eight years. Eight is less than 12. So for prisoner one, informing is the best response to prisoner two's informing. So becoming a police informant here is the best response for prisoner one to all of player two's possible actions. So this actually makes becoming a police informant a dominant strategy for prisoner one. Now, if we're prisoner two and if prisoner one stays silent, then prisoner two could also stay silent and get two years in prison or become a police informant and get zero. Zero is the better option for prisoner two. So informing will be prisoner two's best response to prisoner one being silent. If prisoner one becomes an informant, then we're on this row here. Prisoner two could stay silent and get 12 years or also become an informant and get eight. Eight is less than 12. So for prisoner number two, informing is the best response to prisoner one's becoming an informant. So becoming a police informant, so playing inform, is the best response for prisoner two to all of prisoner one's possible actions. So that's a dominant strategy for prisoner two. Now in our game then, we have one unique Nash equilibrium, which is for both prisoners to inform the police on each other's behaviors in the worst crime. This is also a dominant strategy equilibrium because it's not just the intersection of two best responses, but of dominant strategies. What you will notice though, is that the equilibrium outcome is not great for our players. It's actually what we call a Pareto suboptimal or a Pareto inefficient outcome. Now, just to be clear, when I talk about Pareto efficiency, a Pareto efficient outcome is one where no one can become better off without also making someone worse off. So if we look at our table here, the Nash equilibrium is Pareto inefficient because we can make both prisoners better off and not make either worse off if they just both stay silent. So both staying silent is preferred by both of our prisoners. It's a Pareto improvement from the equilibrium. Now this outcome where they both stay silent, we sometimes call this the cooperative outcome in the prisoner's dilemma. And the idea is that if both of our prisoners cooperated together in some way, somehow, and we actually describe what this cooperation looks like more carefully when we think about repeated games, that's for another video though, but maybe if they could cooperate in some way, they could secure this outcome, which is better for both. 
But it is worth focusing on this outcome just for a bit because it is very unstable. So if we were here, both players, they have a clear incentive to defect from cooperation and to turn informant. Because for instance, if we're here at the cooperative outcome, given that prisoner two stays silent, it's much better off for prisoner one to turn informant and go completely free, get, get that zero. Likewise, once we're at that cooperative outcome, given that prisoner one has stayed silent, it's much better off for prisoner two to turn informant and get that zero and go free. And in fact, economists will talk about solutions in inverted commas to the prisoner's dilemma. And the reason why I put solutions in inverted commas here is because here I'm using solutions in a wider sense than simply solving for the equilibrium of the game, which we've already done. We've already found the Nash equilibrium and the dominant strategy equilibrium. But economists will talk about solutions of the prisoner's dilemma uh, more generally as an answer to the question of how do we secure the cooperative outcome, given that that outcome is the better option for our players? How do we make the cooperative outcome the equilibrium and not the Pareto inefficient outcome where both do not cooperate? And, and in fact, these solutions revolve around repeated interactions and the threat of punishments. So this is another topic I'll talk about in another video. But we have really described here the main features of the prisoner's dilemma. We have one unique Nash equilibrium, which is also a dominant strategy equilibrium, which is suboptimal, it's Pareto inefficient. There exists another cooperative outcome that is not the equilibrium solution to the game. And this outcome is preferred by both players. But this outcome is not a Nash equilibrium. It's inherently unstable. And these features are actually really interesting if you think about it. On one hand, we have our actors here in our model who are really acting according to a very standard way of thinking about rationality in economics. They are just maximizing their own interests. And that seems like a perfectly rational thing to do. But despite this, both of our prisoners get to a suboptimal outcome. So acting rationally here uh, isn't delivering the best outcome. Now, secondly, we see a situation where cooperation that is absolutely mutually beneficial to our players is really unstable. So very often you see the prisoner's dilemma applied to situations where everyone would be better off if there was just some cooperation, but it's just not happening. And so that's it. That's the prisoner's dilemma. It is worth saying, because I didn't say it elsewhere, that, that the game is constructed under full information. So everyone knows the matrix, right? Everyone knows the numbers in the matrix. And so given that, and you can try for yourself, try being at any one of the cells and see that our players really get trapped into the Nash equilibrium. Either there will be an incentive somewhere that makes both of our players fall into that Nash equilibrium, and once they're there, they can't get away from it. Uh, the, the incentives just aren't right to get out of it. So that's it for this video, the story of the prisoner's dilemma. There are so many more videos to do here. To start in the next video, I'll just describe in more detail a more abstract account of what makes the game a prisoner's dilemma. And I'll, I'll also apply the prisoner's dilemma to other domains. So not just a kind of unrealistic story about two prisoners uh, interacting together, but more realistic stuff. It is a really interesting game and there's a lot to say here, but I'll stop now. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys are all doing really well. Have a good one, everyone.